it's a great pleasure to to uh, uh, introduce Sandra Griglin. Um, he's at the University de Paris, and before uh, he was uh, in the Centrum for Wiskunde and the University of uh, of uh, okay. <laughs> now, now I forgot the. Uh, there's a university in Amsterdam, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, but uh, I was not affiliated to the University of Amsterdam. So. Yeah, exactly. And uh, we did a teach with Monique Laurent and Rona Devol, and uh, he will today talk about uh, quantum algorithms from polynomials with uh, solving linear systems faster. The floor is yours. Okay, so thanks for the introduction. So it's it's great to be here, of course. Um, so I'll today talk uh, mostly about work that's not my own. Uh, I wanted to give sort of an introduction to the, the techniques that, that uh, we base ourselves on. Um, so please feel free to interrupt me at any time if you if you have questions. Uh, I cannot see the chat at the moment, but I'm sure that uh, someone will relay the questions. I have a look there. Also, feel free to just unmute and, and uh, talk through me. Uh, so I changed the title a little bit from the announcement. So what I'll talk about is uh, sort of how to uh, construct quantum algorithms based on, on polynomials. And then at the end, I'll talk about uh, solving linear systems faster uh, using the, these techniques. And uh, I sort of put two pictures here. Uh, one of you, the left one, you sort of might, uh, might recognize if you're an expert in this field. So this is the cover of Andres uh, Gillian's uh, PhD thesis. Uh, it's about quantum singular value transformations. So sort of that's the, the, the level that I want to go for, uh, for quantum algorithms from polynomials. Uh, so you know what's coming. And then at the very end, we'll talk a bit about linear system solving. And here, uh, the inverse polynomial plays a big role. OK, and this last part is based on, uh, on joint work with uh, Daniel Silagi and Jordanis Geronides, who are also both at, uh, at ELIF. Okay, so let's let's get started. So uh, I want to talk about two things, and it's really a, a sort of part one, part two thing. Uh, so part one, I want to emphasize again, it's not my work. Uh, so this is really sort of a tutorial style uh, uh, introduction. So I've uh, also omitted many many references to the literature here, uh, but I hope that it will be a sort of an interesting introduction. I'll give some proofs, uh, most proofs, in fact, of, uh, of these techniques. Uh, so I hope you learned something uh, there. So please interrupt me if anything is not clear. And then the second part will be based on uh, on our preprint uh, about quantum linear system solvers. Okay, so let's get started with quantum algorithmic techniques. So some recent quantum algorithmic techniques. Um, so you might have recently read some papers about quantum linear system solvers, uh, Hamiltonian simulation, Gibbs sampling, amplitude amplification, SDP solvers, uh, and so on. And uh, what I sort of want to uh, convey here is that they're all, uh, of course, uh, so they're based on a common theme, which is that if you are given a matrix A, uh, you want to implement some function of A, uh, let's say F of A. And uh, of course, all these papers, they do many, many different things on top of that. But this is sort of the, the common theme that I, I want to, to talk about. And here, uh, I want to sort of uh, discuss all the, the parts of this sentence. So I want to talk about what it means to be given some, some matrix. Uh, I want to talk about how, what we mean by implementing uh, this function. And also, what, what are the functions? Because functions are very generous in general, of course. You can think about determinant, inverse, exponentials, uh, and so on. So what are the, the functions that we want to care about? Um, so for us here, it will be functions that act on the, the spectrum of matrices. Uh, so for this talk, I'll use this definition that uh, when I, whenever I write f of a, I talk about some function f that takes reals to reals, and it's sort of applied to the eigenvalues uh, of this matrix A. So throughout, I'm assuming that A is a Hermitian matrix. This is just for convenience. You can also do all the, everything that I'm uh, going to talk about for non-Hermitian matrices. But then you have to talk about left and right singular vectors and just wanted to make notation a bit easier. So what is f of a then? So if you write a in its eigen decomposition, so d, d, d star, uh, then f of a would simply be the matrix v, f of d, v star, where now we apply f entrywise to the diagonal matrix of eigenvalues. Okay, so far so good, I hope. Um, so now, uh, okay, we want to implement f of, uh, of a. Now, of course, what I just uh, used as a definition gives you a simple recipe to, uh, to do this. Uh, 
you can simply compute the eigen decomposition of this matrix, uh, apply F to the eigenvalues, and then again, compute this matrix product. Okay, so this is great if you have the time to, to actually find this eigen decomposition. Uh, but sometimes you want to do some stuff a little bit faster. So for instance, if, if F is a polynomial, uh, then you can actually do this a bit faster. Um, so the, this is a fact that I just want to, want to state here. So if you're given a polynomial, uh, then uh, evaluating A at this polynomial is the same as just uh, taking this linear combination of powers of A. Okay, so this looks like a trivial statement, but here on the left, I'm, I'm really taking the definition of the previous slide. And on the right, I'm just uh, writing up this sum. Okay, and of course, this is very easy to see if you just uh, express everything in the eigenbasis of, uh, of A, uh, then it becomes a, a, an almost trivial statement. Uh, but this is sort of what, what one can use to implement these functions a bit faster. Because you can imagine that uh, computing identity plus A minus A squared is sometimes a bit faster than first diagonalizing A, then applying uh, this polynomial to the eigenvalues and then recomputing the matrix. Okay, and uh, of course I started off talking about, about functions F and then I switched to polynomials and sort of the bridge that one has to make uh, mentally is that uh, we want to think of applying this to, to smooth functions and those we can often approximate very well by polynomials. Okay, so really the, the objects that we're gonna care about are, are polynomials. Okay, so now let's, let's start going towards quantum algorithms. Um, so then, then I would say there are very, three very natural questions. What is the input? What is the output? And what are the algorithms? Uh, so this is sort of very short, but uh, these are the three topics that I, I want to talk about now. So let's start with the input. Uh, and let's uh, first discuss the classical setting before we go to the, the quantum uh, setting. So in the classical setting, uh, a very natural way to access a matrix is through some, some oracle that allows you to query the entries of the matrix. So it would be a function that takes a pair of indices, uh, i and j, and outputs uh, a i j, let's say the i j th entry of the matrix a. Okay, and here I've taken as the as the uh, codomain uh, the real numbers, but really you should think of this as uh, some finite bit representation of the, the entries of, of a. Okay. And the quantum input, or at least the first model of quantum input that I want to talk about, is uh, sort of the direct uh, equivalence of this. So in, for quantum, you would like to have some unitary. Uh, and what this unitary should do is if you apply it to ket i, ket j, and some workspace, then it just writes the ij's entry of a in this workspace. Okay, so here this plus means uh, addition modulo 2. So often matrices uh, have some structure. For instance, they can be, can be sparse. And this is also a very useful input model to, to compare to in the quantum setting. Uh, so also give a quantum version of that. So for a sparse matrix, uh, what you would additionally have on top of this element-wise uh, and, uh, access to the matrix are these two oracles. Uh, I've called them OR and OC, which uh, take an input, uh, uh, some index of either a row or a column, and another index uh, L that goes from one to, the, to whatever the sparsity of that row or column is. So the number of non-zeros in that row or column. And then it simply outputs the index of the Lth non-zero element in that row or column. Okay, and uh, quantumly you can do exactly the same. And again, we have to uh, work with a unitary instead of uh, uh, an or uh, just a, a map. But it's it's exactly the same uh, the same type of uh, access. Okay, and of course, if you would have an efficient classical circuit that gives you this sparse access, uh, you can also use this to construct efficient quantum sparse access. Okay, so in those in that setting, uh, uh, it's sort of a fair comparison. Okay, so I put a one here uh, next to this quantum input, so that suggests that there's going to be a second uh, quantum input. And indeed, the second one that I want to discuss is a somewhat more recent uh, way of looking at matrices. And it's through this framework that uh, went from qubitization to now I think it's stabilized a bit at block encodings. Um, so what is a block encoding of a matrix? 
so a block encoding of A would be a unitary, uh, let's say U of A, and I see that I forgot the subscript here in the, in the equation, uh, which has on the top left corner, uh, let's say A divided by some, some scalar uh, alpha. And on the, uh, the other blocks, uh, you can have whatever. Now, of course, if this had, uh, is supposed to be a unitary, then alpha has to be bigger than the, the operator norm of, uh, of A. Okay, so this unitary encodes A in one of its blocks. That's why it's called a block encoding. And another way to, to write this is that A over alpha would be equal to uh, this projection of U onto the top left block. Okay. And uh, formally, this would be an exact block encoding of A over alpha, because we really put A over alpha in the top left corner. But very often, it will be useful to allow a bit of error. Um, so instead of A over alpha, we would have a block there that is sort of close to A. So if we multiply this block by alpha, uh, then it's epsilon close to A in the operator. So there are two parameters here, uh, this epsilon and this alpha. And for, sort of uh, in your mind, I would like, to, like you to think that sort of the epsilon is sort of uh, uh, not too problematic. Uh, usually we can decrease it at some sort of logarithmic expense, uh, but the alpha is sort of a bit more, uh, more important uh, because this will be a subnormalization of a state. So if you want to renormalize to, to have the correct state, you will need to pay for, for it in a sort of a polynomial dependence. Right? Some amplitude amplification uh, needs to happen. All right, are there any questions about these two input models? Um, sorry, can you like uh, maybe elaborate a bit like why, uh, let's say, uh, epsilon, like why you can like push epsilon down efficiently while like alpha you can't? Uh, yeah. Okay, or very good. Follow later. But... Very good. So, uh... Okay, let me maybe do the first, first the next slide, which sort of connects the sparse input and the block encoding. And then I'll talk a bit about why in, in this setting, it's easy to sort of reduce epsilon, but sort of alpha is an inherent uh, problem, let's see. Yeah, but, but yeah, please keep the question in mind. And if it's not clear in a minute, we can discuss it. Good. So the example that I wanted to give was of course, the, the relation between sparse, block and, sparse input and, and block encodings. Um, so, and I've, I've written it here as n sparse input because I want to sort of think about dense input because then I don't have to uh, write s's and uh, encoding uh, like index oracles and whatsoever. But really, the construction will be the same for, for the sparse setting. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, what you want to do first is you want to construct uh, two, uh, let's say, state preparation oracles or uh, oracles that sort of produce uh, rows and columns. So, I'm calling them ul and ur here for left and right. And what will the left one do? So the left one will start from, uh, well, it will act on, on inputs of the form 0, i, 0 as follows. So it will prepare a, uh, first prepare a uniform superposition over the, uh, the columns. Okay, we should think of i as a row index and k will be summing up uh, going over in columns. And then uh, what it does is it would query uh, the ik entry. So using this ik here, it would query the I, uh, ikth entry. And then uh, it would rotate in uh, uh, in the amplitude the uh, sort of the square root of aik. Okay. And I think this is sort of where I'm uh, uh, trying to make the distinction between uh, epsilon and, and alpha sort of uh, the epsilon that you would get here really comes from the accuracy with which you can do this rotation. Okay, so you should think of this as, as sort of, uh, you do it bit by bit of the, of, uh, of sort of A, uh, the entries of A. So this really scales log one over epsilon. Okay, so this state you can, or this unitary you can prepare if you're given access to, to this uh, uh, unitary that queries the entries of, of A just by simply writing AIK in the workspace register, then doing some control rotations. And then uh, for simplicity here, I, I removed again the workspace register. Uh, you can do the same for, for the rows. And now to make things correct, I've, I've put here the sign of, uh, of A as well. Okay, so this, uh, this unitary on given a, a column index would prepare a uniform superposition over the rows. Uh, 
and then query uh, a lj and uh, again put it in the, the empty tool. And now the claim that I want to make here is that uh, if you look at ul star ur, um, so for the physicists, uh, the star here is just the same as a dagger, um, then this is a one over n block encoding of the matrix A. Okay, and to see this, uh, what you really have to do is you have to uh, sort of project on uh, the top left block. So that's what these two zeros are doing. And then we're going to look at the ij entry. And now if you sort of work out this, this product, so, okay, let's start from the right. So we start with zero j, and then we apply uh, ur to it. So that's essentially exactly what I wrote here. And then uh, we can see this is an inner product with uh, ul applied to zero i. And then if you look closely, uh, the parts with the, the zero are exactly the ones where uh, i k will be equal to lj. Those are the only ones that, that remain. And then what you're, you're left with is the square root of a, uh, let's say, ij, uh, but squared uh, with the sign that I put over here. And of course, we, we should not forget the normalization. So you get the one over square root n also squared. So that's why you get aij over n. Okay, so this is one way to go from a sparse input to a block encoding. Could you explain again where the sign comes from? Is it just? Uh, requirement here. Right, very good. So uh, what I want to put here in, in this amplitude is the square root of the absolute value. Okay, so that's just a, somehow a technicality. I want to take square roots only of positive numbers. So I need to take the absolute value of AIK. And then uh, what I really want to end up with, of course, is not this uh, absolute value of AIJ here, but I want to end up with uh, AIJ. So what I can do is I can use the asymmetry here or the fact that I have two operators. So I, uh, I just put the sign in one of them. And here I chose the right one, but you can also put it on the left, of course. Um, and okay, so maybe uh, to come back to, to the definitions a few slides ago, I started with Hermitian matrices and now I'm doing everything as if it is a real matrix. Uh, but of course, instead of the sign, you can also take uh, the angle. You can put a, an arbitrary phase there. Okay? Um, Good. And okay, maybe this is a good point to, to comment uh, a little bit more on. So here, what I've done is uh, just created a uniform superposition and then put the square roots of the AIK here. But of course, you can, you can put any power of AIK here and any uh, sort of uh, uh, like the one minus one over the power uh, on the other side. And this is sometimes helpful because what you get now, if you do this, uh, is essentially you get a block encoding that uh, is subnormalized with the sparsity. Uh, but if you take different powers, then you get something that depends on, on different norms of the, of the matrix. Okay, and sometimes this is useful. Uh, but for simplicity, I'm just giving here the one with the, the sparsity. All right. Uh, so I think this is also the po point where uh, hopefully it's clear that there's a difference sort of between this epsilon and, and alpha. So sort of the epsilon you get by just using a bit more precision to, to perform these rotations. Okay, and this is relatively cheap because you just need to use a few extra bits of precision. So you get a log one over epsilon scaling. Uh, while sort of this, uh, this divided by n is sort of uh, yeah, it's really a, a fundamental uh, obstacle in the sense that you, you, yeah, you need to work with states, so they need to be normalized, and uh, yeah, you really need this. Thanks. All right, thanks for the question. Okay, good. So now uh, this is all that I wanted to say about the input uh, of quantum algorithms. Uh, so now let's let's talk about the output. So from now on, I'll just say that the input is given as this block encoding, and I'll also forget about the subnormalization for a minute. I'll just pretend that I'm, I actually care about the top left block here, so it will also be normalized. And then, uh, if you recall from a few slides ago, uh, I said polynomials applied to a matrix is just basically uh, applying, uh, well, taking a weighted sum of powers of that matrix. So now uh, the question is going to be, if I want to implement, let's say, P of A, what should the output be? Uh, hopefully, if I've manipulated your thoughts correctly, uh, you should now all say it should be a block encoding of, of P of A. 
so that's what we're going to aim for. We're going to aim for, let's say, an approximate block encoding of P of A, and of course it needs to be normalized. All right. So just uh, to give an into, uh, to give some idea of why block encodings are useful. So let's think about uh, solving linear systems, which we'll do again later in the talk. Uh, so let's suppose that I'm given a polynomial that approximates the inverse on this range, uh, let's say one over kappa one uh, and the, the uh, symmetric version of it. Uh, so this means that we wanna consider a polynomial a matrices whose condition number is kappa. So largest eigenvalue, let's say one and smallest one over kappa. Uh, then if you apply such a block encoding of P of A to a state of the form zero psi, then what you end up with is uh, basically the, the top left block here will give you uh, zero, that's the, the indicator for that block, times P of A applied to psi, and of course normalized by the, the norm P of A. And then uh, for, for some uh, uh, appropriate approximations of the inverse, this is essentially the same as, or approximately the same as applying A inverse over kappa to this state psi. Okay, and that's great because now you can use amplitude amplification to obtain, obtain some state that is proportional to A inverse psi, which is what you would like to do if you want to solve the, the quantum linear system problem. Um, sorry, can I have a very basic question, sort of a bit on the edge of what you were saying, but I, I should have asked it earlier. So when you have this block encoding, uh, of a of a matrix, you let's say in the upper left corner you have this this this, this mm -hmm. let's say minor a or subnormalized minor a, um, but like when you actually apply those, uh, what I'm a bit sort of how to put it like physically like unitaries they are not like just matrices right but they act in projective way in a sense that you always uh sort of uh act with a conjugate from the other side so the global face is sort of uh like you can always multiply by a global face and it will be the same unitary transformation right mm -hmm. uh so here it, it it would seem naively that the global face of a is not determined uh maybe like uh i mean okay it's some I mean, some misconception probably on my part, but uh, so I, I I think the global phase sort of maybe yeah I think I would say it mostly it mostly kicks in when you when you want to let's say uh, uh, okay so for instance here you apply this unitary to zero psi uh, then okay you get a quantum state but of course if you want to do something with it you have to measure it in some way and I think that's, yeah. that's sort of the point where the the global phase sort of starts to matter. I mean, uh, I mean, my my point is like this: this UA is let's say given as a circuit, right? Uh, yep. So, so sort of formal. How to put it? Do you can you also do control controlled versions of the circuit? You can. It's yes. not okay. Okay, so that yeah. sort of. Probably yes. fixes okay. this global phase. Okay, very good. Yes. Okay, I should have been more precise. So what we assume is we can apply UA controlled versions of it, and also actually controlled versions of the inverse. Because like just abstractly, okay. just U, UA is uh, yeah. like this. Just global phase of this UA is not kind of defined uh, unless you make this assumption. I think that. No. Should. Okay. Yeah. Very good. So we assume that we can also do 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 controlled versions. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, which I think is okay if you start from the sparse input, right? Because then we get really gave a circuit to implement UA. So uh, you can also argue you can do the control version. Yeah. But yeah, indeed, that's very good. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? If not, let's uh, let's continue. Okay, so now I, I want to claim that sort of my goal is to implement polynomial transformations of A because that will allow me to do some stuff with with smooth functions uh, as long as I can can well approximate them. Uh, okay, so polynomials they form a ring, uh, so it's very natural to ask uh, how do we implement addition and how do we implement multiplication. All right, uh, if I know how to do those two things, I basically know everything I want to do uh, with polynomials. 
And uh, yeah, sort of, uh, I want to start with multiplication. Um, so here, uh, my claim is that if you can do controlled applications of your block encoding, uh, then it's easy to also do controlled applications or to also create a, a block encoding of your product. So what I mean is that if you start with a block encoding of A, and let's say instead of, uh, uh, yeah, you, you, uh, you also take a block encoding of B, but you sort of control uh, the first one on, let's say, 0, 0, and the second one on, uh, oh, I have to think very carefully, 0, 1, maybe, uh, on an appropriate, appropriate counter. <laughs> Let's say then you can construct unitaries that sort of act as follows. So you can you can make them act as identity. Uh, let's say on on uh, let's say if we started with uh, uh, only flags zero and one. Now I'm introducing a flag two, and I'm saying that my U A acts only non-trivially on the flag zero and one, uh, and it acts trivially on flag two. And for B I'm going to do the same, but now I'm going to let it act on uh, flag zero and two, and trivially on on flag one. Uh, so I like to think more about matrices. So for me, in matrix terms, this this just looks like like this. You put identity on the bottom right, and here you put identity in the middle, and then you put zeros zeros next to this. And then if you work out this uh, this matrix product, you'll see that indeed uh, the top left corner will now be A B. And uh, yeah, just as before, I don't care about what happens on the other the other blocks. Okay, so if you if you take this trick uh, and allow some extra workspace, uh, allow to control on some some extra flags, uh, then this allows you to implement let's say a a squared a cubed uh, and so on. So this this takes care of the the multiplication part. And uh, now what's left is addition, and usually addition is easier than multiplication, but here I want to argue it's a bit harder. Um, so what are we going to do? We're going to do addition of uh, of unitaries, in fact, because turns out that the language is the same. So we're going to talk about a technique that's called the linear combinations of unitaries. Um, so what is the, the problem here that we want to address? So suppose you're given unitaries u1 up to ud and some coefficients uh, c1 up to cd. And just for convenience, I've taken the coefficients here as positive, but you can also allow negative ones uh, if you want. And uh, when I say given unitaries, you also need to use controlled applications of these unitaries. Okay. And then the problem that we want to solve is we want to construct the block encoding of uh, the, the sum of, uh, let's say, CK, UK, so the weighted sum of these, these unitaries. And of course, we need to sub normalize by, by an appropriate constant, and that will be essentially the one norm of the coefficients. Okay. So let's see a circuit for this. So this is very easy. Well, it's a circuit that looks a little bit like the uh, circuit that we used for constructing a block encoding based on a sparse input. So what we're going to do is we're again going to start from a state preparation oracle. We're going to construct the state preparation oracle, let's say, or assume we have access to it, and these controlled applications of the UI. And then we're going to use that to build uh, a block encoding of the weighted sum. All right, so the state preparation oracle here, I've only defined it act, its action on the zero state. So what it should do, do is just make a uniform superposition over uh, square root coefficient times ket k. Okay, you should think of this k as just a counter register. And then uh, what we're gonna do is we're first gonna apply this state preparation oracle, and then controlled on this counter, we're gonna apply uh, uk. So if the counter here is k, we're going to apply uk, and otherwise we, we don't do anything. Okay, so in, in matrix terms, this looks like, like this, where I've sort of omitted uh, identities on, on the other registers. Uh, so we apply u square root c, uh, then we do this controlled application of the use uh, of the, the use we had, and then we do the, the, the dagger or the star of the, the state preparation oracle. Okay, so let's again verify that this does what we want it to do. Uh, so now uh, we again want to claim that the top left corner of this unitary uh, is equal to, to what we want. Uh, okay, so we again just write it out. So what does it mean to, to look at the top left corner? So we apply u square root c to zero times identity. That's this term here. Uh, we do the same on the other side, but with a star. 
And then in the middle, we're left with this, uh, this controlled unitary. Okay, and now uh, really what you should have, what you should look at is what happens in this first register. So here on the right, you have a cat L. Here you have a sum over the, uh, the, uh, the i's. Here you have a cat K. And it's, since these, uh, these basis states are orthogonal, really what you're left with is not a triple sum, but it's only a single sum, right? Only the uh, pairs K, I, and L that are all equal uh, survive. Okay, so what you're left with is really a single sum. And then uh, you get the square root of the coefficient on both sides. So you get the, the, the actual coefficient. You get the one norm uh, square rooted that's also squared. So you get, just get the one norm and uh, you've applied uh, UL. Okay, so I, I claim that this indeed gives you one over the coefficient norm times the sum of the unitaries. Right, any questions about this? Uh, if not, then I'm going to start putting things together. Um, so I've now shown you how to construct powers of matrices or uh, block encodings of powers of matrices and how to perform uh, linear combinations of them. So sort of the linear combinations of unitary uh, trick will apply it to, to sort of block encodings of powers of A. So let's suppose that UK is a block encoding of a power of A. And you can build this using K controlled applications of a block encoding of A. And then uh, this, uh, this trick from the previous slide, this algorithm, this shows you how you can construct a block encoding of uh, CK UK, which will then be in turn uh, the polynomial of A, uh, of A but subnormalized by the coefficient norm. Okay, and the cost of this algorithm will essentially be the cost of applying all these controlled uh, applications of the UKs in sequence. And since the kth one takes k uh, applications, you're summing up k uh, from one to, to d. So you get uh, order d squared uh, controlled applications of uh, ua. All right, very natural question. Can we do better? Hopefully the answer is yes. Otherwise it's gonna be a very short talk. Uh, and there are several options to, uh, to do better. Um, of course, we can try to improve each of these elements uh, in, this, in this algorithm. So a natural question is, can we get faster block encodings of powers of A? Um, another uh, question that I find maybe more interesting from a polynomial perspective is, what if you use a different basis than a monomial basis? Uh, can we obtain something that uh, uh, we can implement faster or maybe at least has a smaller coefficient norm? Uh, so this is something that I'll come back to uh, sort of in the second part of the talk. And another natural question is, uh, can we do, uh, can we use fewer qubits? This maybe if you want to think about, uh, well, I hate to say it, but near-term applications or something, uh, using many controlled qubits or many controlled gates is maybe not a great idea. So it's very natural to ask, can we, can we use fewer than, let's say, all of these controls for UKs and then, again, doing a controlled combination of it? it sounds a bit uh, bad. And uh, sort of the first, well, the next technique that I want to show you, this quantum singular value transformation stuff, uh, it actually manages to do with just a single controlled qubit. Okay, so instead of having to introduce a counter from, from one to D uh, and also extra controls for all of these powers of A, uh, you just use a single control qubit. So that's great, I think. Okay, so how does this work? Um, so this is kind of uh, very technical, so I'll only be able to sort of uh, give a sketch of, of how things work, uh, but I hope that I'll be able to convey sort of the, the main ideas here. Um, so just to set up a little bit of notation, uh, we're going to do things really about two by two matrices right now. Uh, and then I'll just wave my hands and show pretty pictures that it works for, for bigger matrices. So uh, I just use sigma z to denote one minus one, and uh, I'll use wx for a scalar x, real scalar x, uh, to denote this two by two matrix. Okay. Then uh, there's going to be a very big theorem, as you can see from this huge block. Um, it's very nice. It's uh, sort of a quantum signal processing, uh, sometimes been called. It's from Lo, Lo Yoder, and Chuang, um, based on uh, work also from Lo and Chuang. Uh, and it sort of says the following. So if I take uh, a, a product of uh, factors of the form Wx times e to the i, some phase sigma z, so just uh, a whole sequence of these uh, these two by two matrices, 
then this is equal to, uh, of course, the two by two matrix, but now the claim is that the entries are polynomials in X. Okay, uh, in the sense that on the top left corner, we have some P of X. Uh, the top right corner will have Q of X times square root one minus X squared, which is maybe not too surprising given the entry of, of W there. Uh, but of course, uh, I wouldn't show this theorem if I wouldn't give you more information about these polynomials. Um, so you can easily show that the degree of P and the degree of Q are uh, D or D minus one. Uh, moreover, if you, if you just follow this construction and, and work things out properly, uh, you can see that P has parity D mod two and Q has the other parity. So here, I mean, uh, like a, an even parity would be zero mod two, uh, odd parity would be one mod two. And uh, moreover, you have this, this nice, uh, funny looking identity. So you have that P squared plus one minus X squared times Q squared is equal to one. Uh, so this might look a little bit mysterious, but this essentially just follows from the fact that, that this matrix is a unitary. <coughs> right, so if you accept the fact that there are polynomials here, then this last con condition is just saying that it's a unitary matrix, which it should be because all the, the and factors here on the left are unitary matrices. Okay. Maybe naive question. Yes. This somehow reminds me of like uh, expanding E to the I sigma Z in terms of cosines and sines. Is it sort of similar? Also like here you have like seems maybe not odd in even degree. Okay, I don't know. Yeah, that was the question. Yes. Is it sort yeah. of similar to that? Yeah, it's, it's very, very much related, yes. Yes, so I'll come back to the sines and cosines a bit later. But, yeah. So they nicely fit in this. Yeah, very good. Okay, so if you if you look very carefully, there's there's one extra line in this box, and that's actually the most amazing line, and therefore I've made it very bold. Um, so the most amazing thing is that actually you also can go the other way. Right. So if you have P and Q that satisfy these three conditions, then you can also find angles. So these phi's, I'll call them angles, uh, in such a way that this identity here holds. Okay, so this is really great. Um, so this is maybe uh, almost the best thing one could hope for, except that it's sort of not really clear maybe how to construct P's and Q's that satisfy this identity, uh, but we'll get to that in a, in a bit. Okay, it turns out you can relax this quite a lot. So I think this is a very nice, nice theorem. So it makes sense to, to talk about it for a few more minutes. Um, so especially I wanna sort of make this a bit less mysterious. Um, so let's talk about how to prove it. Um, so my claim is that sort of both directions of the proof uh, are based on, on uh, sort of the same, same uh, ideas. So it's based on, on, on some induction argument. Uh, so I'm not going to do the base case or anything, but sort of what you want to show, for instance, if you want to show how to go from, from this expression on the left to something with polynomials, you say, okay, suppose I know how to do it when I have D minus one terms, then really what you need to look at is, uh, let's say, a two by two matrix of this form, multiply it from the right with W, X, E to the I, phi, Z, sigma Z. And you need to show that there are, again, let's say polynomials P prime, Q prime, uh, that satisfy if I this, uh, additionally with sort of the right uh, degrees and parities and, and so on. Um, the other direction, uh, which I find the sort of more interesting direction is starting from P's and Q's, uh, you want to show that you can also always find angles that satisfy this. Uh, so now what you want to do is you want to say, okay, let's say I have P and Q that are of a certain degree. Then I want to show that if I, take the last term here correctly and sort of uh, put its inverse on both sides of the equation. So I put, uh, I sort of move the last, uh, last factor here uh, over to the other side. So I multiply with e to the minus i phi sigma z uh, w star. Then I would get something which is again of this uh, shape, but now with p's and q's that are sort of one degree lower uh, than, uh, than what I started with. Okay, and this is sort of very mysterious for me that this, this is possible. Um, but what I sort of want to convince you of on, on this slide is that both uh, induction arguments sort of use the same kind of ID. You start with this, uh, with the matrix of this shape, 
and you multiply it with something that's either e to the i sigma z w star or w times e to the i sigma z. Um, so what I'm going to do on the next slide is just do one of the two and then hope that you, you're sort of happy enough with the other one. So I'm going to do the more interesting direction for me, how to go from polynomials to lower degree polynomials. So the identity that we want to look at is uh, we start with this P, these P's and Q's, and I've sort of uh, suppressed the dependence on X just to keep the uh, equations a little bit shorter. Uh, and I'm going to write multiply with e to the minus phi sigma z and w star of x. All right. So this is two by two matrix multiplication. Uh, with a bit of time, you can do this. Uh, so I've done it for you here. So I've just expanded out the e to the minus uh, i phi sigma z w star. And if I didn't make any mistakes, then this is the matrix that you end up with. And sort of what I want to convince you of is that this is again of the form uh, P tilde, P star tilde, something Q star tilde, Q uh, tilde. All right, and if you stare at it for a second, it's clear what sort of the, well, this top left block here would just be P star, uh, P tilde. And the top right block here would be Q tilde times square root, uh, one minus X squared. Okay, so indeed, uh, if I would have started with polynomials P and Q, then at least P tilde is again a polynomial and Q tilde is again a polynomial. Okay, so that's the, the easy uh, step of the argument. Um, sort of the harder step uh, is to show that you can choose a correct phi such that the degree becomes one less. And here you use this mysterious third identity that basically just encodes the fact that it's a unitary matrix. So suppose that I have polynomials P and Q that satisfy this identity. Uh, then I know since it holds for all X in the interval that this is really an identity between polynomials. So the coefficients on left and right hand side uh, match up. So what this means is that the highest degree or the leading coefficient of P uh, minus the leading coefficient of Q should vanish, right? So the leading coefficient of uh, P should be equal to the leading coefficient of Q in, in magnitude. Okay, so it's, modulus or it's moduli are the same. Right? Remember that P was one degree higher than Q, which you can also see from this identity. Uh, so indeed, uh, you get some identity for the leading coefficients, namely that they have the same modulus. Okay, but this is great because this means that if I rotate these leading uh, terms correctly, then uh, they will be able to cancel out. Okay, so now let's look again at, at P tilde. So P tilde will be uh, this e to the minus i phi, uh, where I'm now sort of going to magically choose the phi correctly, times P of x. So the leading term will have coefficient uh, P of d. Okay, it's now going to be multiplied with x to the uh, d plus one, but that's okay. Uh, the leading term here will be e to the i phi times uh, coefficient q d minus one uh, with a minus sign. Right? So q d minus one in q would have been multiplied with x to the d minus one, but here you get an extra x squared, so it's also x to the d plus one. So these are really the two terms that are uh, the leading terms of these, uh, uh, these two polynomials, and they need to cancel out. And the claim is that you can just choose phi correctly uh, because these two coefficients have the same magnitude. Right, so this also gives you an algorithm of how to find all these angles uh, if you're really given these polynomials P and Q. Right? You just need to look at the leading coefficients of P and Q and choose the angle so that they're uh, going to cancel out. Okay, so now I've argued that you can choose phi correctly so that P tilde has degree one less than P. And sort of since uh, this matrix will also satisfy this identity, but then with the, the tildes, uh, you automatically get that the degree of Q is also one less than the degree. Uh, sorry, the degree of Q tilde is one less than the degree of Q. All right, so this is all that I wanted to say about the, the proof of this identity. I hope that it's, or the proof of this, this theorem. I hope that it's slightly less mysterious now. If there are any questions about the, this part, uh, please ask.
Uh, if not, then this is the part where I'll wave my hands and sort of, again, display the nice cover of Anlash's thesis. Um, so the nice uh, thing about this, uh, this theorem that I just showed you is that you can also apply it to matrices. So if you start with a block encoding of a matrix, uh, then sort of essentially the same circuit that I just showed you, uh, where you alternate these uh, sigma z's with uh, block encodings of your matrix, uh, will give you a block encoding of a polynomial transformation of your matrix. Okay, so when uh, this, yeah, like I said, this, this picture here is uh, a very nice quantum circuit, which is actually physically drawn on a blackboard by Andres, uh, and he used this as the, the cover of his thesis. Um, so I also immediately advertise his thesis if you want to look at much more details about quantum singular value transformation. Uh, I think that's a really nice place to, to look at. All right. Uh, some comments about these, this quantum singular value transformation, or at least the, the part that I uh, just showed you. <coughs> so this third identity is a bit mysterious, right? This uh, p squared plus one minus x squared times q squared should be equal to one. Uh, that's a bit mysterious. It's not that easy to see that you can satisfy this in many cases. So maybe it's actually not a very useful theorem. Um, I want to say that there is at least one very important example uh, that we'll again see later on about Chebyshev polynomials, uh, where they do satisfy this identity. So if you look at Chebyshev polynomials of the first and second kind, they exactly satisfy this identity that we, we saw over there. Uh, but actually, there is much, uh, much more to be said. So if you just look at which polynomials P can you achieve, so if you forget about the Q part, or which ones can you find an appropriate Q for, uh, then it turns out that this is a very easy to describe uh, set of polynomials. Namely, if you, uh, if you look at, for instance, odd polynomials, then they just need to be uh, bounded by one in absolute value when the interval minus from one. And then you can always find a P tilde and Q tilde that now have complex coefficients, where I started with real coefficients, uh, in such a way that uh, these P tilde and Q tilde satisfy this, uh, this theorem, and P is going to be the real part of P tilde. Okay, if you don't like uh, parity constrained polynomials, you can use the following very, very, very useful corollary. Uh, if you take a, an arbitrary polynomial of degree D, and uh, if it's bounded by a half on the interval minus one, one, then you can also uh, block encode P of A uh, over alpha. <coughs> so this is sort of the most easy uh, way to apply this theorem. You just need to show that your polynomial is bounded by a half. Okay. So indeed, uh, this, this quantum signal, uh, signal, uh, signal processing for quantum singular value transformation is indeed extremely useful, I'd say. Okay, so let's go back to sort of the, the motivation slide that I had a, a while ago uh, about recent quantum algorithms. So I sort of chose them on purpose, of course, because all of these are sort of based on uh, nice polynomial approximations of, of smooth functions. So for quantum linear system solvers, you can think about approximating the inverse. Hamiltonian simulation is just complex exponentiation. Gip sampling, real exponentiation. Uh, sort of a, a linear version of amplitude amplification would just be multiplying with the scalar, of course, on the interval one over C, one, uh, minus one over C, one over C. And for quantum SDP solvers, we use this Gip sampling quite a bit and also use the approximations to the square root function, for instance. Okay, so the, the, the takeaway here is that the state of the art algorithm for many, many of these problems uh, follows from a good polynomial. Okay, and I've now sort of tried to convince you how to, uh, how to implement these polynomials uh, using quantum algorithms. And uh, I just wanted to put yet another disclaimer here. This looks like it's sort of a quote. Uh, I don't know who would have uh, said this, but I think it's sort of morally true, uh, but don't quote me on this. <laughs> there might be, uh, <laughs> there are definitely exceptions uh, to this framework. For instance, there's a very nice way to do Hamiltonian simulation uh, in a time that depends on square root of the sparsity, whereas we don't know uh, how to do block encoding of sparse matrices with this dependency. So it's sort of, a, yeah, it's a funny, a funny business. Um, sorry, can you comment on high level how this Hamiltonian simulation algorithm works? Like, 
I mean, okay, probably it's in, um, but is it like for some Hamiltonians with structures, some lattice Hamiltonians and uh, no, I think this, general. I think this would be in general Hamiltonian simulation if your access to the Hamiltonian is is given by a sparse access. Uh, it's known how to construct, let's say, e to the i t h in time that depends on square root sparsity to the power one plus little o of one. Uh, and for me, this is a kind of mysterious, uh, a mysterious result because I don't. So suppose that you're given this this Hamiltonian simulation, then you could also take the log and uh, get a block encoding of of h, in time that again depends sort of on square root sparsity to the one plus little of one. Uh, but this is something that we don't know how to do directly. So this, I think, yeah, I also asked Andras at some point, and I think he, he also, yeah, for him, it was also sort of an annoying open question. It's sort of the only uh, result that he hasn't, well, hasn't yet shown how to do in the block encoding framework. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think the Hamiltonian simulation paper itself is, uh, yeah, it's quite, it's quite technical. Uh, it, it's based on trotterization, I think. Uh, and some some clever bucketing of, of eigenvalues and, and yeah it's really it's really quite quite complicated. Uh, I think sure. it's I think it's also from Low and Chuang if I if not mistaken. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I have also a question. Um, yes. I remember this paper on 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 the matrix exponential. I think it was somehow called like nineteen dubious ways of calculating the matrix exponential. <laughs> And then they sort of explain why why uh, <coughs> many many uh, approximations to the exponential fail in some kind of weird cases. Like, how does this apply here if you do some sort of Taylor expansion or because you you write it as a polynomial, right? So you you have to sort of expand. Yes. yes. What happens there? Can you comment on this? So the matrix exponential you just mean about, for instance, for Gibbs sampling, right? Yeah. For example. Or even yeah, so it, yeah, you have to you have to always be a bit careful about how to uh, approximate your smooth function with with polynomials. Let's say, uh, I think for for the exponential, there's really not much going on. You just take the Taylor approximation and you you uh, you truncate. Uh, so uh, if I remember, course, for example, this paper was saying, oh, if you would do this with unitaries, then the, the the thing won't be unitary anymore, but it will have a grade. <laughs> You want to do this with unitaries then? Let's say you want to do the Hamiltonian simulation and you do it with Taylor, then the resulting uh -huh. polynomial is not unitary. No, so, uh, okay, that's a good point. So you, uh, okay, so you would, for instance, uh, let's say e to the i x, right? It's just cosine uh, x plus i sine x. And then you could use polynomial approximations to both cosine and sine, right? And then uh, if you sort of combine them in the correct way, you indeed don't get e to the i x, but you get something that's kind of close to it. But that's sort of in the same setting that these block encodings, we allowed a little bit of error, and we also allowed some, some subnormalization. Uh, so I think it's, it's true that you wouldn't, yeah, you wouldn't, you maybe wouldn't exactly get the Hamiltonian simulation, but you would get some subnormalization and approximate version of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think I would like to argue that for most applications, this is okay. Uh, but of course, it's not exactly uh, exactly the same, right? But for instance, for these SDP solvers, uh, we're totally happy with getting a, a one half uh, version of e to the minus x uh, trace normalized and, and also uh, approximations of, of the square root. This is also always well. Very often, this is this is totally fine. Yeah. I hope this answers the, the question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Very good. Okay, so uh, okay, this talk is maybe going to run a little bit longer than I expected, but I hope that you're you're getting something out of it. Um, so I wanted to sort of say that uh, quantum singular value transformation is great, uh, but it's not the end of the story. Uh, so for me, there's just a sort of a philosophical question of what are these angles? Uh, can we understand them? Where where did they come from? So if I know, well, I gave you a proof of how you how you can find them. Um, you can, you can also compute them somewhat efficiently. Uh, but this is clearly the case if you're given these P and Qs that sort of sum up to, to identity, but also in the, in the case where you have to complete your polynomial first, uh, you need to do some root finding, uh, but you can do this uh, somewhat efficiently, um, but it's not really clear what is the intuition for me uh, for these angles. Um, 
And then a second question that I sort of wanted to use as a motivation for the rest of the talk is how does one actually prove that the polynomial is bounded by a half? Uh, so this is very easy if P approximates a bounded function, say e to the minus x or something, uh, because then it's, uh, it's just bounded because it approximates a bounded function. And uh, this is sort of becoming already a bit more problematic if, if you're, uh, the function you're interested in, uh, say the inverse, uh, we really only want to approximate it on, on these two intervals, uh, delta one and minus one minus delta, okay? Uh, because now suppose that I give an epsilon approximation to x inverse on these two intervals, then it's not at all clear uh, how this approximation behaves on the part in between. Right? But for this quantum singular value transformation, you also need control over this part in between. So one, one way to get out of this problem is you, you take your polynomial P and you express it in a basis of elements that are bounded uh, on the, the interval. Uh, because then the one norm of the coefficients will give you an upper bound on, uh, on the absolute value of Px uh, just by trying to inequality. So what are some nice bases? Uh, so the one that we started with is actually nice. Uh, so the monomial basis indeed has this nice property that if you take x to the k, you evaluate it at something that's small, uh, at most one in absolute value, and that's at most one in absolute value. Uh, another basis, which is not really a basis for polynomials, but okay, uh, Fourier basis. And the last one that I want to mention, and also go into a little bit more detail in a minute, is the, the Chebyshev basis. Uh, so this is a basis of very nice polynomials. They're orthogonal uh, with respect to an appropriate measure. Uh, they satisfy this property that they're at most one on the interval. Uh, and yeah, I think they're really quite nice. Uh, but the question that uh, sort of motivated me to look at all these problems is sort of what is the best or right basis? And it's not, uh, it's not completely clear to me uh, yet what would be the great answer. Uh, but I think I want to make a sort of a case that the Chebyshev basis is indeed actually quite a nice basis to look at maybe not the best, but it's, it's quite nice. Okay, so let's define the, the Chebyshev polynomials. I'm sure that you've seen, you've all seen them at some point. Uh, so you can find, uh, define them either geometrically in the sense that uh, t, the, the teeth one uh, applied to a cosine just uh, puts a factor t in front of the, the angle, or you can define them using uh, this nice recurrence. So if you start with uh, uh, one and x, then the, uh, you can define them iteratively uh, using this recurrence relation. <laughs> uh, why are these very nice polynomials? So they're extremal in some sense, uh, in many senses, I think, but this is the one that I wanted to highlight here. So if I give you an arbitrary polynomial that's bounded on minus one, one, uh, then I know what happens outside minus one, one. Uh, namely, if I evaluate it at a y, y that's slightly larger, uh, then its value will be less than uh, the these Chebyshev polynomial evaluated at y. So here d would be the degree of d. Okay, so somehow these Chebyshev polynomials, they grow the fastest outside of the integral. Uh, and if you're more visual, then uh, this is a picture that I stole from Wikipedia uh, that gives you the first five uh, Chebyshev polynomials. Okay, so they kind of nicely uh, oscillate in some sense. All right, uh, then uh, I want to sort of convince you that they're nice also in the singular value transformation uh, framework. And I think this also comes back to a question that Felix asked uh, a bit earlier. So they actually have very nice angles, namely you can just use pi over two uh, all, uh, all over the place. And uh, this will in fact implement this, uh, these Chebyshev polynomials uh, up to a phase, so minus one to the t, all right. So what I want to highlight here is that the circuits that you get for these Chebyshev polynomials, if you use this quantum singular value transformation uh, approach, are all prefixes of each other. So they're all just the same sequence of operators with different lengths of the, or different numbers of copies of this sequence. Um, so I'm going to claim that this also makes them very nice for this uh, LCU approach. Uh, because remember there, the, the, uh, the, well, the approach that I showed you needed to uh, implement these controlled uh, applications of powers of A. But now if you want to think of uh, UK as sort of implementing a block encoding of the kth Chebyshev polynomial, then we can do something smarter. Uh, we can just use this one fixed sequence. And after every application of, uh, of one uh, uh, factor in the sequence, 
we just uh, control on whether or not we still need to continue. Okay, so we control on whether the counter is bigger or smaller than, than uh, the coefficient that we, uh, we have in the counter register. Okay, so that's what I tried to condition to convey here. So for polynomials in the Chebyshev basis, this uh, controlled unitary application uh, becomes a little bit easier. So you don't have to do all these UIs uh, sequentially, but you can sort of reuse what you're doing for lower uh, degree Chebyshev polynomials to implement the higher degree Chebyshev polynomials. So in particular, the cost of this one over C block encoding now just becomes D applications because we don't have to sum up uh, these separate ones, but we just do it once. But we use a different control operation after each uh, application. All right, so this gives you a very natural question. Uh, if I look at polynomials that are bounded uh, on the interval, uh, what is the largest one norm that I can obtain? Right? Because this one norm is something that I will be penalized for in the, in the subnormalization. So it would be great if this one norm is actually quite small. Uh, of course, uh, you can give a very easy bound on this one norm, uh, which I'll do later. It's, it's just the square root of the degree. So if you don't care about polynomial factors in your subnormalization, polynomial in the degree, uh, you can simply use, instead of quantum singular value transformation, which is very nice, and I don't want to tell you not to use it, but if you want to use this combination of Chebyshev polynomials, you only lose a factor square root degree. Okay, that's a worst case bound. Uh, for many applications, in fact, it turns out that it's only log degree. So if you don't care about logarithmic factors, uh, which I often don't, uh, then you can uh, instead just think about this simple circuit. All right, so this finally brings me to part two, and I hope you still have uh, a little bit of energy. I think I'm running over time a little bit, but uh, uh, I can't. Really wrap I this think part. another 10 minutes or so would be, would be good. Maybe a bit okay. More. I don't think I have much more to say than 10 minutes. Super. All right. Very good. Okay, so quantum linear system solvers, which is the thing that Felix asked me to talk about. Uh, I'll finally do it in the last 10 minutes. Uh, so we finally got there. Uh, so what is the problem that we want to solve? We want to solve linear systems, right? So we want to solve AX equals B, where we're given A and B. And we're okay with solving it approximately. And we're uh, going to use either two notions of approximately. So we either find the next tilde that is close to A inverse B, or we find an X tilde such that A times X tilde is close to B, right? These are two uh, equivalent notions in the sense that up to a change in, in whatever epsilon I put here, uh, they're equivalent, okay? And uh, here I wanna say that uh, the, the first notion is, is the most used one for, for quantum algorithms, but you can also use the second one. It's, it's, as long as you have log one over epsilon dependence, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter too much. Okay, so the quantum problem here is to produce a state that is proportional to, or close to, uh, well, proportional to this X tilde, right? So it should either be close to A inverse B normalized or uh, such that A times it is close to B. And uh, yeah, sort of if I've managed to convince, uh, convince you of one thing, the way to do this is to construct a block encoding of something that approximates A inverse. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. And that's actually also what people did before us, uh, because then to get this state x tilde, you can just use some version of amplitude amplification to get your state. Okay, so this is sort of the standard way to do it, uh, and by the standard way, I mean uh, not what Hero, uh, Hasidim, and Lloyd did, but what Childs, Kotari, and Soma did in, in 2016. Uh, so they looked at this simple polynomial that approximates the inverse. So it's uh, essentially the inverse but then you subtract something that is uh, supposed to vanish uh, as long as uh, X is quite small, right? So it's, it's, uh, it's good. And then uh, this polynomial, you can see that if you choose the parameters correctly, uh, then uh, it epsilon approximates one over X on this, uh, this domain. And then uh, what this means uh, is of course, that if we apply this polynomial to A, we're pretty close to A inverse as long as uh, the spectrum of A is contained in the set. Uh, and then what you can do is you can write the polynomial in the Chebyshev basis. So this is actually what Charles Kotari and Soma did. They also did this whole linear combinations of unitary stuff uh, uh, in their nice paper. 
So what they did is they just expressed this PT in the Chebyshev basis. Uh, you get the following very nice expression. So these coefficients here, they look a bit horrible, but if you think about it, it's just the probability that a sequence of two T coin flips has more than T plus I heads. Okay, don't worry about it if that went a bit fast. Uh, it's just that these coefficients have a nice uh, interpretation. And in particular, uh, you can use these coefficients to show that this polynomial is bounded uh, by kappa. Okay, and you can also, if you look at these coefficients a bit more carefully, uh, you can show that they, you can see that they decay very fast, right? Which also sort of comes from this uh, picture of viewing them as tail bounds on uh, probabilities of getting more than t plus i heads. Uh, this this probability should decay very fast, right? Just by some some uh, uh, some concentration, right? So instead of using k squared many terms, you can actually truncate after order k terms. Uh, and I forgot log factors here. I'm sure. All right, so for the more visually uh, inclined people, uh, these polynomials, they look like this. So I put this picture here because it's very nice and my co-author made it, so I had to put it there. Um, so what sort of got me interested in this uh, was sort of a connection to iterative methods. Uh, so if you know gradient descent a little bit, then the polynomial that you saw on the previous slide will actually just be the polynomial that you get if you run gradient descent on uh, the natural quadratic function associated to this linear system, namely this f here. So if you just run gradient descent on this, uh, and I think for the sake of time, I'll not go through this, uh, I'll just sort of show here or highlight the conclusion that the teeth iterate is exactly this polynomial applied to a times b, okay? Uh, just trust me on it. Uh, so then uh, this is the polynomial, by the way, before truncation. So another way to interpret Charles Cotari Soma's paper is that they, they started with this very nice gradient descent. They looked at the end result. They forget about the whole iterative method and they just uh, get a nice polynomial out of it. Uh, it's maybe a bit too short, but sort of that got me interested here uh, because then the very natural question is what do better iterative methods give us? Can you sort of, so we know that they, of course they also give us polynomials, but can we also implement these polynomials uh, efficiently? Okay, so that's what we did in our, in our uh, small paper. Um, so it's very classical theory to see what is the best polynomial that approximates uh, the inverse. Uh, so here we take this notion of, of approximation. Uh, you do some, some sort of magical rewriting of the polynomial that you're trying to look for. And then you see that the problem really becomes, uh, you want to find the polynomial that is one at zero and minimizes the maximum absolute value on this domain that we talked about before. Okay, and this min of max should sort of uh, remind you a bit of this extremal property of Chebyshev polynomials, namely that they are the fastest growing outside of their uh, domain. So sort of if you translate or if you sort of flip this on its head, what it means is that if you want to fix a certain value a little bit outside their domain, uh, the Chebyshev polynomials would be the ones that have the smallest infinity norm on, uh, on the interval. Okay, so it's not too surprising that the optimal polynomial then turns out to be a shifted version of Chebyshev polynomials. And uh, you can choose the correct degree of these Chebyshev polynomials to get an approximation here. Okay, and this, uh, if you want to sell this, you can say uh, this gives you an iterative uh, quantum algorithm in some sense, but really from, uh, from a, a gradient descent perspective or something, uh, this is a very well-known method. It's called Chebyshev iteration, okay? So this is great. You get a polynomial. It approximates the inverse on the domain you care about. Uh, but of course, what we want to show is that you can also implement this on a quantum computer. So if you want to use the quantum singular value transformation framework, you need to show that it's bounded by, let's say, a half on the interval minus 1, 1. And uh, if you just want to use linear combinations of unitaries, uh, you also need to bound, let's say, the, the uh, one norm of the coefficients in the Chebyshev basis, right? And actually, I don't really know of a better way to upper bound the polynomial on the entire interval than just by expressing it in a basis that is bounded on the interval. So as far as I know, the only, the only way to show that this is a bounded polynomial is really just to, uh, uh, to look at the coefficients in the Chebyshev basis. 
So that's what we did. And then you can show that they are uh, essentially exactly what you would expect. Uh, they're essentially two times the degree. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, asymptotically the same as Charles Cotari Soma. So that's why I put the, the uh, er in faster sort of between parentheses because it's uh, faster only if you look at the constants. If you look at the asymptotic behavior, it's of, of course exactly the same. So the idea of the proof, which I think I'll just skip, is to use the, some orthogonality properties of Chebyshev polynomials. Uh, if you do that, you can get a nice expression of. Uh, 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 of the Chebyshev coefficients, the coefficients in the Chebyshev basis. And then it's simply a question of comparing norms. So you want to compare the norm of the coefficients. Uh, you start with the one norm, you go to the two norm, you express it using this nice identity here between this horrible looking matrix and the vector of uh, evaluations at roots of Chebyshev nodes, uh, polynomials. And then you uh, use what the operator norm of this matrix is, which is very easy to compute. And you get the bound on the one norm in terms of the two norm of evaluations of your polynomial at Chebyshev nodes. Um, so remember, a while ago, I promised you that square root degree was an easy upper bound. Uh, this is the point where square root degree is an easy upper bound, because this is a length de uh, degree vector uh, of evaluations at points that are between minus one, one. So it's two norm is at most square root dimension. Okay, and then you need to do hard work or harder work uh, to show that actually you get the right bound on this, uh, this two norm of the vector of evaluations. Okay, then uh, to finish, uh, I think I'm really running over time right now. I just wanted to convince you, uh, indeed, you get lower degrees if you use our polynomial than the charles cotari soma polynomial. Uh, in pictures, uh, if you compare to the, the different notion of approximation, so not the one for which we're optimal, but the other one, which people care about more in the literature, uh, you can still ask, is our polynomial better or not? Uh, indeed, it turns out that it's, uh, again, factor two-ish uh, better. Uh, in this case, you can also compare to a mini-max polynomial, so you can just look for the best polynomial, and uh, there we're slightly worse. Okay. So we're optimal in the first sense of approximation, uh, but it turns out we're actually still pretty good in the second sense of approximation. All right, uh, so that gives me uh, the last slide, which I'll just show and maybe go over very briefly the second point. So sort of what I tried to convince you here is that the one norm of this optimal approximation of the inverse is kind of small. And uh, actually just out of curiosity, we checked whether this is also the case for many of the other approximations to interesting polynomials or interesting functions that are out there in the literature. And for most of them, actually, it turns out that the one norm in the Chebyshev basis is only sort of a log degree. Right? The only exception here seems to be uh, cosine kappa x, or the one for Hamilton simulation, if you want. Uh, that one seems, at least numerically, it seems to satisfy this, uh, this square root degree behavior. Uh, but I'm, I'm not very confident in claiming this because it's uh, we didn't prove this by hand. Uh, numerics are always a bit shady, uh, so I don't know uh, what to take from this. But I wanted to just highlight that there is a very easy way to actually obtain cosine kappa x in sort of the same uh, spirit. Uh, namely, you can just construct the block encoding of cosine, kappa, uh, cosine x. So this clearly doesn't have any kappa dependence. And now you simply evaluate uh, it using, uh, well, you simply evaluate the Chebyshev polynomial on it. Okay, so that's uh, sort of, it's maybe not in this framework of having low one norm of the Chebyshev coefficients, but it's still quite easy to obtain a good approximation of cosine X. And then again, apply a simple circuit, one that I can understand, maybe the one for the Chebyshev polynomial. Okay, uh, I think that's all I, I wanted to say. Uh, thank you for listening. I hope you learned something. If there was anything unclear, please feel free to ask. Thanks a lot, Sander. It was a very nice talk. I think that was very interesting. Um, do we have questions? Maybe, maybe I start with a question. So I was wondering, like, at the end of the day, you, you apply this sort of polynomial to a state and evaluate it, right? Uh, you, understand that. you apply the polynomial to the matrix A, and then you, uh, yeah, you take this block encoding, you apply it to a state zero, cap psi, or something. 
you get an approximate. So, yeah. So this linear, I was wondering like what happens if you would, if you would, um, because here you do this linear, how's it called, LCU, linear combination of, 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 of unitaries. You, you sort of put it all together into one unitaries. I was wondering what would happen if you would have this polynomial and then expand it and then measure sort of each term, how this corresponds to like the number of gates you need extra to. Uh, so you mean you would get a, on expectation, you would get the right state or? I mean, if it's a linear combination of terms, you could simply measure each term, right? In this. And, yes. And then sum up the values, like how this, how this trade-offs that, how there's a trade-off with the, with, with the number of measurements you need to do versus the number of sort of gates and handling gates that you need to do. Or... Okay, it's a very good question. That's uh, naive uh, view. My... Yeah, so I think maybe the, the, uh, the, 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 the silly answer is if you, if you really care about getting this block encoding, this is not a way you can, you can get this block encoding, of course. And I think often the block encodings are really more interesting than, than block encoding applied to a state. Uh, but I still think your, your question is very interesting. And I've, I've also wondered a bit about what, what happens indeed if you just take each of the terms separately uh, and then uh, sort of, uh, okay, let's say, suppose that you want to do tomography on your state or something, you want to really know the state. Then uh, of course, I, I would not suggest to do LCU. I think, you, I think it would be much easier to just do each of the terms separately, do the tomography in each of the terms and then combine them, right? You don't need to do all these control uh, mm -hmm. gates and whatnot. Um, yeah, that, yeah, that's a very good, good point. Um, so one, one thing that uh, sort of, I'm a bit worried that might not really go through. So what I, what I said is you want to do amplitude amplification, right? Because what you get is you get, for instance, for, for inverse, you get inverse divided by kappa. Uh, which is really what you want if, you're, if your matrix has condition number kappa. Uh, but it turns out that, so this is, I hinted at this, you want to use variable time amplitude amplification because it turns out that if you just do the naive way of taking this block encoding and then trying to work out the, the, the condition number, uh, the subnormalization, you would actually get a kappa squared dependence, uh, which is not optimal. You can actually get a kappa dependence, not a kappa squared dependence. And the way to do this is uh, using variable time amplitude amplification. So here, sort of the, the high level idea is that you uh, you want to amplify. Uh, okay, so if you if you look at x inverse or a inverse over kappa times some state, then this is very much uh, subnormalized if your state was supported, let's say, on the large eigenvalues of, of a. Right? Because then A inverse will be approximately identity or something, and uh, you subnormalize by kappa. So you have to multi like amplify out this factor kappa. But actually, if you started with something that, that was supported on very high eigenvalues, you don't need to use a very complicated inversion polynomial. It's much cheaper to invert uh, eigenvalues that are very close to one. Right? So you sort of want to use this variable time amplitude amplification to sort of balance out these two worst cases. Sort of where is it hard to invert the matrix um, and where is it hard to do the amplification because on the other range of the spectrum for the eigenvalues that are very close to one over kappa there uh, a inverse over kappa is actually the right normalization right so you don't need to do any amplification and i'm a bit worried that if you would do all this uh, this measuring and then uh, i don't know combining after uh, it's not so clear to me whether this works uh, works well with uh, with these kinds of tricks. Okay, I see. Yeah, but I might be wrong. Maybe it's maybe it's possible and it's easy. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry, I just want to uh, like make sure if I understood your answer just now. So uh, what you are saying is that like to 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 boost the yeah the amplitude or like the yeah the the strength of the signal, you need to have coherent access to your state. Like after yep. this pr procedure was. Yep acting okay because yeah. like i i guess what what felix is suggesting is something like people would call prob probabilistic error cancellation type of stuff like you would i mean i mean like that, that would be like you would expand the sum uh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but but then without yeah. this coherent access you would be losing this this dependence on kappa uh, yeah i think typ typically you would like to do some amplification afterwards yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Right. But perhaps this is more feasible because you don't need all the, I mean, okay, you need maybe smaller control. Or, I mean, okay, you said that it's only one extra qubit. Uh, okay. Yeah, so if, if you do this LCU of Chebyshev polynomials, you, yeah. may, you may need quite a few controlled qubits, but of course you can also just use the, the QSVT framework, right? And then you have a single control qubit. Gotcha. Yeah. Right. So I, I, yeah, I think I just like the linear combinations of Chebyshev polynomials because it's something that I can easily picture and easily understand. But if you want the state of the art, you always use the, the quantum singular body transformation, right? Right. right. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, and another question, like, so did I understand correctly, this, this block encoding, is that a sort of a trick to make an arbitrary matrix unitary? Is that the idea? Yeah, so you just want to embed it into a unitary matrix. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, maybe I'll ask something else, and then then we should probably because it's uh, yeah, it's not, it's not finished. Um, could you could you say something about? I mean, I, I remember maybe it's in the same context or different. So these Chebyshev polynomials seem to be quite useful for certain things. Also, like I think there was one paper about ground state, uh, ground states of gap Hamiltonians and so on. Is there is there something like? So, so is this is sort of the key feature they use everywhere that when you know that the when you know that the that, that the polynomial is is bounded in in some finite region, then then it will always be below the check check. Is is that the key feature that these papers generally use? Uh, so I don't know I don't know which, which uh, yeah I don't know exactly which paper you were referring to, but uh, indeed one of these extremal properties is that they're sort of the fastest growing outside a certain small region. And that's a very very useful property. So Chebyshev polynomials, they, they appear in many, many contexts in quantum information theory. So they, they appear in quantum walks. They also appear in Grover. Like you can view Grover as just doing. Mm, OK. Yeah. So you can use it for, sorry to bump in, like you can use it for interpolation, right? Like if you know that in like some low degree polynomial, I mean, I guess you're sort of using it. Like uh, when it's bounded in some small epsilon region, then you can bound the, the growth, right? From yeah. So in, in, yeah. Yeah, in uh, in some sense here here it's we're doing in sense in some sense interpolation, right? Sure, but I, I mean like this this extremal property you can use for yeah. and like for example like when you when you have some okay some different stuff like worst to average case reductions to in the hardness of sampling, like people use Chebyshev polynomials there for example for similar yeah reasons. Okay, I don't know. I don't know so much about that, but I can imagine they, they pop up in, in many different places. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot for the explanations. Uh, let's thank thank us again, Sandra, for the nice talk.